Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everybody. This is Spud Woodward, uh, your chair of the Atlantic Manhattan Management Board. Uh, welcome to our board meeting this morning. Uh, as uh, has been happening most of this year, we are scattered from Maine to Florida once again. Uh, not where we want to be necessarily, but uh, we're going to get our business done. We have three hours this morning to complete the items on our agenda. You, you have a draft agenda before you uh, for consideration. Are, are there any uh, recommended additions or changes to the agenda as presented? If Megan Ware. All right, go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just um, had one quick item under other business, if there's time. Yes, okay, we will, we will take care of that. We'll add that under other business. All right, very good. Are there any other changes, additions to the agenda? Uh, if so, raise your hand. If not, then I will consider the agenda approved by consent. We also have available in the briefing materials the approval of proceedings from our last meeting in August uh, 2020. Um, and uh, are there any additions, deletions, corrections to those minutes? I see yes. hands. hands. All right, very good. Then I'll consider those proceedings approved by consent. Uh, this is uh, the time that we will take public comment for items that are not on the agenda. So is there anyone in attendance who would like to make a comment? Any hands? We have Don Lyons. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Lyons. You have three minutes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make a brief comment today. Uh, my name is Don Lyons, and I'm Director of Conservation Science for the National Audubon Society. I lead research, monitoring, and conservation activities for Audubon's Seabird Institute, whose goals are to promote the understanding and protection of seabirds and the ecosystems that they rely upon. Our work, uh, primarily in Maine, but also elsewhere, contributes data on seabird prey, forage fish, to inform fisheries management uh, in the Gulf of Maine ecosystem and others along the Atlantic coast. Audubon's over 2 million members care deeply about marine and coastal birds and are dedicated to protection and recovery of these species. Uh, so we applaud the board's decision in August of the ERP framework that will allow the board to use ecosystem-based management for this vital forage species to protect its role coastwide. Now it is time to properly implement the ERP when setting catch levels from Manhattan. We submitted a letter along with three other groups in support of your action today to adopt a total allowable catch of Manhattan for 2021 and 2022 that is less than or equal to a 50% probability of exceeding the ERP target of F equal to 0 0.19, or a total allowable catch of 176,800 tons or less. This TAC level would not significantly limit commercial catches, but would ensure that myriad coastal and marine predators, including striped bass, other large predatory fish, coastal birds, sea turtles, and marine mammals have sufficient access to this critical food resource, which will benefit other coastal businesses as well. In addition, the board should consider a buffer to further reduce the TAC to more fully account for risks and uncertainties associated with the ERP model and the Manhattan stock assessment, plus the overfished condition of herring, striped bass, bluefish, and weakfish, among other species. Thank you very much for your efforts today to sustainably manage Atlantic Manhattan and for consideration of these remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you ask about Peter Hemchuk? Peter, I was say I wanted to comment later on the motion. Okay. 
Thanks, Peter. Spud, I think we might have lost you. I'm not hearing you speak. See you. Oh, you can't take control back. All right, I got you covered, but okay. Yeah, you muted me. <laughs> Somebody muted me. There okay, is very good. History. Um, sometimes the system is muting people automatically. We don't know what's happening, so we'll keep an eye on them. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Pete, I, I hear you. Uh, uh, I'll I'll afford an uh, opportunity for some comment after we start deliberations on the tag. But you know, this public comment period is for items that are not on the agenda. So you'll you'll have an opportunity later. I understand. Any that. other any other hands, Tony? Uh, no, no other hands. But Peter, did you know your hand went back up? <sighs> And Pete, you're okay. Hopefully, you're muted now. Okay, yes. no other. All right, very good. Okay, seeing no more uh, public comment, we'll move on to item number four. And the way we're going to handle this is we're going to have a technical committee report from Corinne and Flora, but we want to split it up. Uh, uh, we're going to ask her to, to do a report on the fecundity estimates. Uh, part and after that stop uh i'll go to jeff uh for an opportunity to provide perspective from the ap on the fecundity estimates and then we'll discuss and deliberate on that and we need to take action uh on fecundity estimates uh, targets and then once that's uh taken care of we will move on to the total allowable catch presentation and i'll go to jeff after that for uh for an AP report on that. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So with that, um, Corinne, you're up. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, see if I could get this to do what I want it to do. <laughs> That is the wrong direction. <laughs> Max, um, can we make it so that um, someone else does the presentation and I speak? Sure. Uh, Maya, if you want to just. There's not cooperating. <laughs> it's not a problem. Maya, if you want to take control back and just click through the slides for her, we're going to pause after the fecundity slide, Corinne. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, and, and thank you to the board for allowing me to speak today. Um, my name is Corinne Flora, and I am the TC chair. Next slide. So my presentation today um, will go over some background on the process, um, and then I will review the fecundity reference points. Um, as stated, I will pause there and allow the board to discuss, and then we will go over the um, <clears throat> board task tack levels. And at this time, at that time, we'll take questions on that part of the presentation. Next slide. At the August board meeting, ecological reference points were approved. This adjusts the fecundity reference points outlined in Amendment 3. Also at that meeting, the board tasked the TC to develop a range of TAC alternatives for the 2021-2022 season. In September, the ERP work group developed a memo for the board on the revised fecundity reference points. And additionally, the TC met twice to develop the TAC alternatives tasked by the board. Next slide. So the ERP fecundity target and threshold defined as the equilibrium fecundity that results when the population is fished at the ERP F target and threshold respectively. 
were calculated using the same methodology used to produce the single species fecundity reference points in the past. As shown in this table, the 2017 estimates of fecundity was above both the ERP target and threshold, indicating that the stock is not overfished. This is the uh, only slide I had on the reference points. So at this point, um, we can discuss this further. Thank you, Karim. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward uh, analysis. And so I'll open up the uh, floor for questions for Karim uh, on our FEC reference points component of today's meeting. Don't see any hands raised, Doug. Oh, here we go. We have uh, Emerson Hasbrook and then Lynn Bagley. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Corinne, for your presentation. So, <clears throat> our, what are the current 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fecundity levels? Is that what's in that column under single species fecundity, or is it something different? So this is based on the, the terminal year of the assessment. Um, so um, it is the, the 2017 estimated fecundity. Answer your question, Emerson. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, be willing to make a motion if you're ready. Okay, well, if you'll hold on just a second, let me call on Jeff Kalin. Uh, when the AP met recently, they, uh, they talked about this, uh, not in great length. I'd like to give him an opportunity just to provide the AP perspective on this. So Jeff, uh, would you mind doing that for me? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning to the board. I'm uh, speaking to you about 100 miles south of Long Branch, New Jersey. Uh, I'm very sorry that we're not all together at the Ocean Place Resort, and I look forward to the opportunity to, first of all, to get back together in person again. I'll uh, just make a brief introduction about our AP meeting um, at 5 p.m. on October 8th. And uh, I will comment at this time uh, just briefly on the ERP uh, portion of the discussion. Um, we had pretty good presentation, uh, excuse me, representation of the AP. Um, a number of people, however, uh, were not able to actually get on the call. So I provided them an opportunity to provide uh, written comments and really what we've done in the past. and. Uh, as long as I've been chair, is give everybody a chance to offer their own individual comments and try to have those reflected, uh, or at least uh, the sense of them uh, in in the memo. And I think uh, I think Max did a good job with that on the ERP fecundity target and threshold discussion. Um, Max reviewed uh, what we've just seen. There were some clarifying questions um, about better understanding the ERP assessment and and how the uh, ecosystem reference points were calculated. And, and that was similar to Emerson's question, I think, trying to compare uh, the 2017 um, fecundity projection against uh, how it uh, has been calculated in the ERP model. So there were no recommendations made by the AP, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the remainder of our meeting focused on the uh on the TAC alternatives that's all i have thank you thank you jeff i appreciate that um okay uh lynn uh, back to you thank you mr chairman uh so i would move to approve the ecological reference point fecundity target and threshold which correspond with the fishing mortality ERPs approved in August 2020 for the management of Atlantic Menhaden. The ERP fecundity target and threshold 
are to be defined as the equilibrium fecundity that results when the Atlantic Menhaden population is fished at the ERPF target and threshold, respectively. Thank you, Lynn. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Malcolm Rhodes. All right, we have a second from Malcolm Rhodes. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, you see the motion. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Any no. hands? No hands are raised. Any opposition to the motion? If so, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. on the total allowable cash projections. Sorry, Spud, you, you broke up a little bit there. Let's uh, go ahead and move on to the uh, total allowable catch part of the presentation. But I'm not sure if Maya heard you say, just so you know, Maya, it was motion carried without objection. Right. Okay, Maya, whenever you're ready, next slide, and we will continue. Thank you. So, with the ERPs established, we move to the tax specifications. As a reminder, in the past, the board has set annual or multi-year tax based on best available science. With the established ERPs, the projections were run using the BAM, since this model is better at short-term projections. Next slide. Based on the ERP difference in the BAM from the last time the board <laughs> reviewed projections in 2017, there was also an update on how recruitment is projected. The terminal year of data for these projections is still 2017, as that is the terminal year of the assessment. So we are projecting out a few years now at this point. As discussed at your previous meeting, under the single species reference points, the board buffered acceptable risk to a lower probability. Now that the board has established ecological reference points, you may consider a level of risk is acceptable which is higher or lower than when we were using the single species reference points. Next slide. The TC undertook the analysis, the board task for projections. These were to provide the tax that have a 25 to 60 percent probability of exceeding the ERP fishing mortality rate or <clears throat> F target in 5 percent increments using the <clears throat> using 2021 and 2022 to combine and separate by years. And the percent risk of exceeding the ERP F target and threshold in the current TAC, if the current TAC was changed by negative 10% to positive 10%, also in 5% increments. This includes a 0% change for the current TAC. Next slide. As reference, here is table one from your memo. Again, 2017 is the terminal year of the assessment. In 2017, F was below both the ERP target and threshold at 0.16. However, the TAC was lower in 2017 and landings were below the TAC. Next slide. To address the first board task to provide tax that have a 25 to 60% probability of exceeding the ERP target in 5% increments using 2021 to 2022 combined and as separate years, a tax has been calculated for the projections using 2021 and 2022 
as or separately. Table two in the memo is presented here. There were two approaches for combining the years with the, that the TC discussed. One approach was to provide the average value of the risk at the probability level. However, there was not one unique solution with respect to the average. And there were concerns by the TC that this would result in confusion. The second approach was to provide an attack that does not exceed the level of risk for either year or the lower of the two tax provided in the table two. Therefore, the tax for 2021-2022 combined would be the TAC from 2021 when the years were calculated separately. Associated tax for combined years ranged from 148,000 metric tons at 25% probability to 197,200 metric tons at 60% probability. Next slide. To address the second board task, percent risk of exceeding the ERP target and threshold under the current TAC and levels above and below this TAC, the TZ calculated percent risk in both years. Increasing the current TAC has a 0.5% chance of exceeding the ERP threshold. As for the ERP target, risk ranges from 52.5% risk with a 10% reduction from the current TAC to a 70.5% risk of exceeding the target with a 10% increase in the TAC. Next slide. To inform the board further, the TC has provided in the memo figures displaying the fecundity, recruit, full F fishing mortality rate and landings for projections done with the current TAC of 216,000 metric tons, a 10% increase, 25% risk of exceeding the ERP target, and 60% chance of exceeding the ERP, or, yeah, the ERP target. <clears throat> this slide represents the current TAC, the blue lines indicate the ERP threshold. The orange lines indicate the ERP targets. The dashed black line is the 50, 50th percentile or the median. The dotted black lines are the 25th and 75th percentiles. And the solid black lines are the 5th and 95th percentiles. Next slide. Another way to visualize fishing mortality is with a density plot of F by year. The density plot in 2021 illustrates a 50% risk probability with the current TAC. The dotted vertical line represents the F mean. The dashed vertical line is the F target and the solid line is the F threshold. F has the highest chance of being close to the target and a lower chance of being at the extreme values. Next slide. The same analysis was run for 2022. Peaks in density are similar in F per year from 2021 to 2022, just at a higher magnitude. Next slide. Um, with that, I can take questions from the board for any clarification. I'll tell you what, if, if, if it's all right with you, Corinne, what I think I'll do is ask uh, Jeff Kalin to give his AP report and then we'll do questions for uh, both you and Jeff. That's that, that suits everybody. That sounds good. Okay, so Jeff, if you'll go ahead and give the AP report for me, please, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, 
we had 13 of 18 members um, present. There are uh, there's one or two people who wanted to drop off or who have dropped off, and I think Max knows who those folks are. We had um, and what we did. I as chair, I did not make any comments. I, I normally don't. I use the meeting to take comments from the, uh, the other AP members. And uh, in this case, Mr. Chairman, we have um, 12 uh, members of the AP seven making comments in support of the status quo tack and five um, that had other perspectives. So if we have time, I, I think it would be useful for me to, to, to talk through these bullet points. I'll, I'll ask you that spot as the chair, whether I should take that time. Um, perhaps there'll be the same arguments or discussion that the board itself will have, but I can go through those quickly if you'd like me to. Yes, please do, Jeff. I think that would be good for, for the board. Okay, thank you. So seven AP members spoke um, or submitted comments in favor of the status quo tax. Uh, and, and the rationale were, was as follows. Um, given the precautionary nature of previous TAC decisions, which resulted in an F below the interim ERP F target in recent years, a risk of 66% of exceeding the ERP F, the new ERP F target will not adversely impact the role men Hayden play in the environment. It's overly, second bullet, it's overly precautionary to set the tack for men Hayden based on the risk of exceeding the ERP F target. For example, the federal risk policy for setting an ABC is based on risk of exceeding the OFL, the overfishing limit, a value akin to the ERP F threshold. Uh, status quo has zero chance of exceeding the F threshold in both years. Uh, then since the striped bass population is overfished, there's less demand for Menhaden right now. And it was explained previously that even setting the tack to zero for Menhaden would not be enough to restore the striped bass population. Then given the precautionary nature of the tack in recent years, Maintaining the TAC at current levels for the next two years is reasonable and supportive of the environment and the fishery. Then the TAC should remain status quo, particularly during this time of economic crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, harvest in 2020 will be well below the TAC due to lost fishing opportunity, thus providing an additional buffer to the fishery. In other words, there were some fishermen that spoke about their uh, inability to get a complete season out of um, this fishing year uh, due to the virus. Not in all cases, but it was brought up. And then there were five AP members that spoke or submitted comments in favor of setting the tack at a level associated with the 50% probability of exceeding the ERP F target in both years. Uh, the rationale included um, the statement that fishing at the ERP F target is intended to maintain a forage base for striped bass and other predator species that support important commercial and recreational fisheries. 50% risk tolerance of exceeding the F target is appropriate and consistent with past decisions. And then the board should continue on the path of ecosystem-based management and not revert back to single species management approaches. These TAC values are guided by new ERP modeling and management approaches, which the board committed to in August with the adoption of the ecosystem reference points. Another comment was that it's important the board give the ERP models every opportunity to do what they're intended to do. Future decisions should be consistent with the ERPs that have been implemented. Uh, these decisions go beyond helping rebuilding the striped bass population anything less than a 50% probability relative to the target is inappropriate. The value of other fisheries that depend on Menhaden's forage must continue to be considered. And then yes, um, there is good abundance of Menhaden right now. And that's the result of precautionary management actions. These new ERPs allow for continued success. So those were the specific comments on this portion of your meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think I'll close out though by saying that one of the other issues that was on our agenda was the election of a new AP chair. I guess when you get to be my age, you get put out the pasture. 
and uh, I'll no longer be your chair, uh, but I will look forward to remaining on the AP. So uh, Megan Lapp from Rhode Island was elected the new AP chair, and she will assume uh, the chair position after this meeting this week. And by the way, uh, Megan just became the chair of the um, New England Herring Advisory Panel uh, with Burke Joggerton uh, retiring. So I think Megan will do a good job as the chair. She's with Seafreeze um, in Rhode Island. Uh, many of you know her already. And uh, so I was pleased to pass the torch to Megan. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, there was uh, there were a couple AP members who talked about their on the water experiences in recent years, mm -hmm. and commented that there have been more small fish and fewer larger older fish in the catch, particularly in the Northeast. This was inshore um, in the Gulf of Maine, I think. Uh, and then the AP also did express some concern about the six thousand pound incidental catch provision and that participation and effort has really increased to concerning levels in recent years and the harvest under the provision does not count towards the tax. so the ap recommended that these issues be addressed in the next management measure um, that's moved that you move uh the board would move ahead for atlantic menhaden mr chairman so um the ap adjourned uh, the meeting at 6 45 and that ends my report thank you I'm happy to answer Thank any questions. You. Thank you, Jeff. I um, appreciate the report and uh, appreciate your your service to the commission. Uh, I can just tell you, uh, being put out the pasture is, is a relative term. A lot of us have uh, were tired and thought we were going out the pasture, and we were not. So, uh, so thank you for everything you've done. And we look forward to you continuing to participate on the AP. So, at this point, I will open up. Uh, for questions for both Corinne and Jeff, uh, just raise your hand and we'll uh, we'll take them in the order in which the hands are raised. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, the Menhaden Brain Trust with us, uh, uh, both from the commission and from NIMS, both for live. So uh, if you've got questions that, that sort of harken back to the, the model and some of the other analyses, then we can certainly try, try to see those are addressed too. Uh, so with that, Tony. Thank you, Sven. You have um, Justin Davis, John McMurray, and Jim Estes. Okay, go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question for Corinne, and it, it goes back to those density plots of fishing mortality under the 216,000 metric ton tack. I'm wondering if we could possibly, yep, there they are. So these are interesting. Um, I've, I've got two questions. One is, what's the explanation for sort of the bimodal kind of distribution here? Um, and also, if I'm interpreting these correctly, this this suggests that under a status quo tack, most model outcomes would suggest that we're going to end up with a fishing mortality rate that is above the target. So I'm just wondering if that's a correct inter interpretation. Thanks. So Katie may be better at answering the bimodal portion of this. Sure, I can jump in there um, and then and hand it back to you when we're done. But basically, so the way these projections are done is that you are taking the we're taking output from our uncertainty runs that we call the um, the, the MCB runs where we take different combinations of parameters and uh, to figure out sort of the uncertainty about where we are in the terminal year and then project that forward with additional uncertainty about recruitment um, and things like that. And so one of the things that we found when we did the um, initial set of, of uncertainty runs kind of about the terminal year is that there's some combinations of fecundity and natural mortality that result in a much larger population um, and a lower F rate. Um, and so that sort of represents that little peak to the left um, where that same set of landings will give you a lower F rate. And then there's also, you know, a big chunk of those landings come out with the, the or a big chunk of those runs come out centered around um, that higher, um, higher F rate and a lower biomass. 
Um, and so when you pull from that combination of runs, you get that same set of landings will give you a higher fishing mortality rate, um, which is that bump further to the right. Um, so it, it's related to some of the uncertainty in the model about where we are in 2017. Um, and how that gets folded into these projections. Um, and I think actually Amy Schuler is also on the line, so if she has anything that she would like to add to that answer, uh, she'd be a good choice as well. And Amy, if you raise your hand, I'll be able to find you quickly so I can unmute you just in case you're not unmuted. Hi, Kristen already unmuted me. Yeah, I mean, it's just a function of the uncertainty analysis, which is what Katie just described. A lot of these plots can have that kind of an appearance. Okay, Bryn, anything to add to that? Uh, nothing else from me that was much more concise than I would have been able to put it. So thank you very much, Katie. Okay, uh, Justin, any follow up on that? No, I'm good, Mr. Chair. Thank you for those answers. Those are great. All right, thank you. All right, uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Um, I have a question about the AP report, but I, I suppose it's for Corinne. Um, so it seems to be a common theme that no matter how much we reduce F on the day, and it's not going to bring striped bass back. And of course, that's true. It'll take a significant reduction in F along with probably a few good JAIs to get us where we need to be. But at the AP meeting, the industry seems to be arguing that the striped bass population is reduced to such an extent right now that we don't need all that menhaden. Now, my understanding is that striped bass was used for its sensitivity to the model, and it's not necessarily the only species affected. Um, in other words, if there's enough striped bass at target SSB, then there would likely uh, if there's enough four striped bass at target SSB, then there will likely be enough for everything else, bluefish, weakfish, dogfish. Um, in other words, it's being used as an indicator species. Uh, is that correct? I mean, it's not simply that we don't need all this menhaden in the water because striped bass are depleted. Um, that's my question. I have a follow-up too, if, uh, depending on what, what the answer is. Yes, so the ERP target and threshold are both based on the ability, the, the maximum F of menhaden that sustains the striped bass at their biomass target. Um, so, and this is when striped bass are fished at their F target. So we, we are using the striped bass target biomass in the Menhaden target and threshold. Okay, I understand that. Um, I guess what I was asking is that it's not really just based on stripe, I mean, stripe bass was picked because other species would theoretically do well if there was enough Menhaden for striped bass at target SSB. Uh, is that correct? Um, for the most part, yes. Um, the the striped bass um, it it was the most consistent model, um, and and yes, the assumption is that if we sustain the striped bass, the the other fisheries will also be sustained. Okay, thank you, and. Going back to, to striped bass, a theme on the other side is that the continued intensive fishing on Menhaden does reduce the probability of a striped bass recovery. Um, and it's common in the comments to reference that Menhaden fishing at its current level actually reduces stri the striped bass stock by 30%. Um, can you clarify that? And, and what specifically are they referring to when they, they mentioned that 30% number? Um, and I'd also like to ask about the viability of maintaining a menhaden population at a level high enough to provide for that continued availability as the stock rebuilds. So this is Katie. I can maybe jump in on some of the ERP questions. Um, but the, so I guess I'm not, sh the 30%, 
the thirty percent comment isn't I don't think is one that I've heard before. Um, so I um, the I think kind of there's probably yes the idea is that if you I can so I think you know people did we said originally that um, if you don't reduce fishing mortality on striped bass there's no level of menhaden harvest including a moratorium that would bring striped bass back to the target that obviously doesn't mean that you know striped bass would stay at any particular would would not benefit from less fishing mortality on striped bass under that scenario but uh, changing F on Menhaden isn't sufficient to bring F back to their target. However, when it's combined with a reduction in F on the um, striped bass side, then fishing Menhaden does have an impact on the striped bass recovery trajectory. And so if you consistently fish Menhaden above the ERPF target, then you're going to jeopardize the recovery of striped bass to their target, even if you bring striped bass F down to their target, down to the striped bass F target. Um, so you need kind of that combination of fishing Menhaden at the ERP target and fishing striped bass at the F target to bring striped bass back up to their F target, to their biomass target. Um, and if one of those Fs is significantly off, then um, it's going to affect the the trajectory of that recovery. Um, and so I think you know people were talking. One of the things that came up maybe was the this idea that right now striped bass has taken a um, a cut on the fishing mortality side. We've put in new regulations to bring F down to the target um, starting in 2020. Although it looks like declines in catch in 2018 and 2019 um, have also benefited the stock. Um, but that if we kind of continue where we're um, at, at the F target for striped bass, then at the end of our rebuilding plan, we'll have a 41% chance of being at or above the SSB target. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's where that 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 number came from, but um, I don't know if this is helpful or if this helps answer your question or if there's anything you want to clarify about your question. Uh, actually, no, that was very helpful. Thank you, Katie. All right, thank you, John. Uh, Jim Estes. And, and Spud, you also have um, Adam Nowalski had his hand up in the mix. All right, I'll call on him after Jim. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, Corinne, thank you for the, for, for the memo and the explanation. In fact, I think I almost got it. <laughs> um, if you wouldn't mind going back to table two, I have a couple questions about that, if you don't mind. Okay, so my question is, it appears, to, it appears to be, as you go from TAC for 2021 to TAC for 2022 underneath each scenario, there is an increase. And so I have two questions about that. Why does it increase? And secondly, could we expect a similar trend for the third year? So when you do the years individually, the reason the second year has an increase is due to recruitment. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, if without the additional years of landings, if we kept projecting forward, there is a possibility that the third year would also increase, but all of that is based on um, the model and the recruitment from year to year. Okay, thank you. That's that's what I expected. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a good slide to be on here, uh, but I'll refer back to what I believe was the first bullet point in the first slide that talked about our task here today to set annual specifications or 2021-2022 specifications. So the question I have is, uh, are, does annual mean something different for 2021 and 2022? Are we looking to set a single number for 2021 and 22? 
or do we have the option before us today to set a single annual number just for 2021 and then revisit that for 2022? And once I get an answer to that, I'd like to have a follow-up question. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Spud. Um, yes, we, we have the option as a board to set Bud, you're cutting out. We can't hear you right now. Look back for a year. It was our, I think it's our intent to set it for two years at this. But uh, but um, you know, yes, we can we can set it for one year. And I'll remind everybody if we do not uh, make a decision about 2021 and 2020, well, 2021, then the current tag would carry forward. So Max, uh, County, anything you need to clarify on that? Did I get it right? But you cut yeah. out in the middle of your beginning. So I think probably what you said, and just to yeah. make sure Adam has an answer, <laughs> is that you can set it for one, you can set it for multiple years or not. It's the board's choice. The and as you just said, you thought it was the intention to set it for two years. But Adam, if you only set it for one year, you don't have to revisit for the second year. You would just set the second year um, later on. If you set it for two years, you can always revisit what you have set. If you revisit and want to make a change, then it would be a two thirds majority vote to change it. Okay, great. So okay. basically there's uh, five options on the table, do nothing, which means we roll over with status quo measures. Uh, next option is set the tax for one year for 2021, which would require us to take this process up again, same time next year. Next option is to set a tax that would be the same for 2021 and 22. Third option is to, fourth option is to set a tax that would be different in 2021 and 2022. And then the last option would be to set some number, either the same or different for 2021, 2022, but revisit it for 2022, which a two thirds majority. So if we went the route of just one year setting only 2021, uh, is there anything from a technical nature that could be brought forth? We know that a lot of work went into this ERP work. Uh, it's an ongoing task. Is there anything that would come forward to us that would better inform us for 2022 if we only took action for 2021 today? Um, so, um the additional data that we would have um, would be the actual landings for 2020 that we would be able to put into projections. Um, beyond that, um, I, I don't think that there's any other um, data or analysis that would be available at that time. Okay, thank you, Grant. All right, Tony, uh, any more hands raised for questions? I don't see any hands currently. Okay, any questions for, for your last opportunity? And uh, Tony, I see several hands up actually. Uh, unmuted. Katie, they, they were just, they're going. So Allison Colden had her hand up, then Richie White, and somebody else just had their hand up and then they put it down. So I don't know. Tony, I also okay. see a bunch more. Oh. All right, all right. Um, so I'll, we have John Clark and Connor, Nicola and Dennis, and then Justin Davis. And okay. I can. So, uh, Allison, we had Allison, Richie, John Clark. Who else? Um. Connor, Nicola, Dennis, and Justin. Okay, All right. Okay, we'll start with Allison. Go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, get some feedback from the technical folks um, about one of the comments 
from Jeff Palin's AP report and want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So I think Jeff reported in from those who are in support of the status quo um, that the F is below the ERP F target. And I think that that's referring to the 2017 terminal year F. Um, my understanding of that is that the terminal year F was under a lower tack and also a tack that, uh, or a harvest level that was um, lower than those, than some of those that we're considering today. So I was curious if the um, technical folks could sort of walk us through that and explain um, where the 2017 harvest levels and tack were um, that got us to that F that was realized in 2017. Thank you. This is Corinne. Um, so Allison, um, you are correct that in 2017, the tack was lower and the associated landings were also lower and those are associated with that f which is under the target and the threshold um I, is there more to the question than that i know that that gets the first part of your question yeah um that uh that pretty much covers it. I was hoping we would have those numbers on hand, but if you don't have them um, at the ready, then that, that'll that suffice. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this is Max. Um, so the, there's a table in the report, Allison. Uh, we showed it in this presentation. Maya, if you could go back one slide. Um, so I think this, uh, shows what you're asking for uh, pretty well. The 2017, that's the terminal year from the from the assessment. And that 0.16, which is below the ERP F target and F threshold, represents the harvest level that occurred in 2017, which is in that last column, 173,000 metric tons, which in turn was below the tack of 200,000 metric tons. And we've been hearing a lot about a tack of 216,000 metric tons. That's been the tack since 2018. That's the number that's in everyone's mind. So I think this is a good reminder that that terminal year estimate 0.16 reflects the landings that occurred in 2017, which was under also under a lower tack. Thanks, Max. That's what I was looking for. Appreciate it. Yeah, yep. thank you, Max. Okay, uh, Richie White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have a question for um, whoever uh, is able to answer. Um, I'd like to know, um, are there any species that uh, the commission manages uh, that we maintain a population at or above the target? I can jump in and um, so just with my experience with striped bass, I mean, that's a, a good example of a management program that also manages towards the target, both the fishing mortality and, and biomass targets. I'm sure there's other examples, um, but that's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Richie. Um, yeah, no, I was trying to get at, <clears throat> um, what we're doing here today would be to um, keep <clears throat> keep a population at or above the target and i'm wondering if we have any species we manage where we accomplish that so you know are there are there species i know we attempt to reach the target uh, uh, on all our spe species that have target and thresholds <clears throat> but are there any species that we actually accomplish maintaining a population at target or above? Spiny dogfish is actually currently above their biomass target. Um, so as, as just one example, that actually is in this model already. 
CFAS is also above its target. Um, okay, okay th thank you. That That's helpful. Fobia is as well, maybe? Hmm. All right. Thank you, Richie. All right, John Clark, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentations. They were very informative. Uh, my question is for Jeff Kalin about the AP, and I'm glad this slide is up here because it shows that uh, the landings have been below the tack for the past three years. And Jeff, it wasn't clear from the report whether what the economic impacts of reducing the TAC would be at this point. Obviously, Menhaden is a critical uh, bait for so many other commercial fisheries like blue crab and now increasingly for lobster. Uh, did the members of the AP did any of them express uh, concerns about being able to meet the demand for other fisheries and what impact this might have on the economics? Because we really don't see much about the economics at all in what we've been looking at here. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, uh, you know, we I spent a lot of time at the councils too, and uh, you know, we we see a lot more economic evaluation at the councils than we typically do at the commission. Um, I think that the people who are in favor of the status quo perspective is that the stock is in very good condition right now, and getting back to John McMurray's questions about striped bass and the relationship to where we are today. Um, with striped bass not being rebuilt till 2029, I think we feel the stock is in very good condition. Um, I, all I know, and I'm, I'm also on the New Jersey Council, I'm not representing the New Jersey Marine Fisheries Council right now, but I am the chairman of that committee and we had an AP meeting the other night. And I know here in New Jersey and around numbers, um, we were at 80 million in 2011. Uh, we were down in the 40 million range um, after 2012. Uh, the commission has allowed us to get 20% back since then. So over the last eight years, we've gotten back to about 50 million. And at a 10 cent fish, that's a $5 million fishery. So here in New Jersey, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer your question, John. Uh, a 20% cut is a million dollar loss to fishermen uh, in this state, and most of their small scale fishermen in the bait market. And you're right about the extent of that market. It, it's significant. It's an opportunity, frankly, um, to, uh, to sell more Menhaden uh, into the lobster fishery now that um, herring is down. And uh, by the way, those striped bass estimates, I think there were like four stomachs that were, uh, ha you know, her that had herring in them. So I'm not sure we need a herring buffer here. So I don't want to, I know I'm the chair, I'm not supposed to uh, editorialize, but it's a big, it's a lot of money. It's a, it's about, a tw you know, millions of dollars coastwide to not realize the catches that we have now and have had in the last three years. And you can see last year for 2019, it was darn close to the tack and and in a range that you know most management bodies would look at it as success and frankly i think my last personal comment is we we should be declaring success with this fishery frankly and um it's difficult looking at the science looking at the bam projections and what you have in front of us with these extremely conservative er projections um that uh, we we could all be declaring victory here and saying, you know what, we're already there. And I think uh, we would like to minimize the potential to lose a million dollars in the Menhaden fishery uh, this next two years. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, to Adam's point about setting a tack for this year and then taking a look at what happened next year, you'd have another year of 216,000 to look at and determine what percentage of that tack was taken and create new projections to give you a sense of security about your risk tolerance today. Um, rather than taking a 
uh, you know, a, a, a hit over a couple of year period, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I know that's not traditionally what I'm allowed to do, but it's my swan song. So thanks for the question, John. It's a good question. It's a good question. Thank you, John. Uh, any follow up to that? Uh, I'm I'm good. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, Connor McManus is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question um, is for Corinne, and I just wanted to clarify this for the edification of the board. Um, when we look at tables two and three within the TC memo, um, obviously, when we look, the, the range of tax within there overlap, and of course, have different uncertainty, um, as well as the probability of exceeding the target ERP. So I just want to confirm that as we look at those values, we should, particularly from 2021 to 2022, we should consider those analyses mutually exclusive because they have um, different risk associated with them, correct? So we shouldn't be thinking about how a TAC in year 2022 of a scenario in table three relates to a scenario in table two that's associated with probability of exceeding the ERP is correct? Uh, you are correct that these should be mutually exclusive, um, that you, you shouldn't compare between the two tables. Great. Um, and my, my second question is more um, perhaps maybe for Tony or the commission. But, you know, as we think about, and just to follow up to Adam's comment earlier, when we think about years 2021 and 2022 or a one versus two year tax setting, um, I'm just curious as to how those timelines may um, interact with some of the risk and uncertainty um, policies that the commission is also working on and perhaps timelines of which those tools would be available in the context of our discussions for today. That is a great question, Connor. I know that I believe we're very close to the risk and uncertainty policy being almost complete. Um, I haven't gotten an update from Jason or Sarah recently on where exactly they are to finalizing. So I would need to go to them to be able to give you a better idea of when it would be available. But I think there's a possibility it'd be available to you next year. Sarah, would that be a misspoke? No, Tony, that's that's correct. Um, we're we're closing in on the finish line, I think, um, and should have that available hopefully uh, for the winter meeting. Great, thanks. I just want um, folks to consider that as um, that seems to be a tool that would really aid us uh, in this effort. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to come back to the 2020 lands. Um, there was a comment in the advisory panel report um, about lost fishing opportunity in 2020 and an assumption that we would come in below the tack again um, this year. Uh, that, that wasn't. Nicola, you are cutting out. Almost like you have frozen. Mm. Hey, Nicola, do you think you could try to type your question? The assumption is that staff has not put any type of you know preliminary landings data together that would be able to inform us otherwise. This is Max. Uh, Nicola, you you definitely cut out for a good chunk of your question. Nicola, we lost I I you could... for. I think yeah. I might be able to piece together what you're asking for. Um, and I, the answer is no. Uh, we don't have landings data for 2020 right now. At least we don't have complete landings data. And um, aside from the number of transfers that have been coming in, we really don't have an indication of which states have utilized or, or caught their quota 
this year, 2020. Anything okay, thank you. That, no. All right, thank you. Thank All right, thanks. Uh, Dennis Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've heard a lot of things this morning. I'd like to make a few comments and then ask a, a question at the end of my comments. Adam talked about setting specifications for one year, possibly two years, and and we would have data from this year, but it would be my opinion that the data from this year, I think Nicola just alluded to that, that it might not be very useful because of earlier comments that COVID has affected fishing habits, so on and so forth. Secondly, I think that we've found, in my opinion in the past, that setting one year specifications just finds us back doing what we're doing this morning over and over again. And we're better when we do specifications for multiple years as we've done in herring, shrimp, and other, other things, I'm sure. So not a proponent of setting specifications every year, unless there's mitigating circumstances. But in the board, as the chair said earlier, we do have that opportunity at any time to take board action. Uh, earlier too, John McMurray talked about relationships with striped bass. And as he said, it's like an indicator species. There are so many other factors or so many other things that we considered when we went to ERPs. So that being said, we do have to consider, you know, the whales and the birds and Another thing that I find up here in the corner of New England is that when there's a robust population of Menhaden, we're more apt to see Menhaden. And when we see more Menhaden in our waters, we see more striped bass. A good indicator of that was uh, 2019, where we had Menhaden right in close to the coast for a good part of the summer, and striped bass fishing was excellent. Not so much this year. So all that being said, a final comment would be that too bad that Jeff's going out to pasture, but I'm sure we've not seen the last of him and we've always appreciated having him provide input and his AP report today was, was excellent. But again, he had comments seven on one side, five on the other. And if we knew who the participants were, you know, we could probably we'd know what they were going to say just by knowing who they are and who they're representing. That's always the case with the APs. My last, uh, my question would be, this would probably be directed to Katie Drew. What are the implications if we exceed the target for Menhaden in the long term, looking out to 2030? What are the implications for striped bass if we're exceeding the target on Menhaden. Thanks. Uh, this is Katie. So yeah, I think, you know, in the short term, the next couple of years, it's there's too much uncertainty in the models to really be able to tell you what's the effect of, say, going over in 2021 versus 2022. But in the long term, if we consistently fish above the F target, then the ERP, the ERP model suggests that we won't be able to get striped bass back to their biomass target, even if we are fishing striped bass at their F target. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Dennis, for the, for the comments and the questions. Okay, I have uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I had raised my hand earlier because it seemed like we were sort of unexpectedly winding down discussion and comments quickly based on the number of hands that were up and thought we might be ready for a motion to help focus discussion. Uh, it seemed like there were more hands up than we thought at that point. So I'll just put it out there that I, I am prepared to make a motion to help further the discussion, but I'll leave it up to your discretion if we're at that point now or if we want to take some more uh, questions and comments. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Uh... Tony, do we have more hands? 
I just want to confirm, um, Allison, your hand is still up and John McMurray's hand is still up. And I don't know if they had put them down and then raised them back up again. Uh, yeah, I put my hand back. Your hands back up, John? Yes, it is. Okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, okay, so Jeff brought up the herring buffer, and I'm curious if there was any discussion on that, either at the pay, that either at the AP meeting or uh, otherwise, even at the staff level. I, I know it was a recommendation at some point, but then it seems to have disappeared from all of this. Korean, eighty. So I would say that uh, we'd put that out there as a sort of a source of scientific uncertainty that the board might want to consider when they're discussing, you know, when they think about how comfortable they are with their levels of risk um, for this fishery. But I don't think we have any, we don't have any further quantitative guidance to give the board on that topic. Um, so maybe if Jeff wanted to expand, um, Jeff Kalen wanted to expand on that, I think he could from the AP's perspective. Um, yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, and I, you know, I, I did look into this um, issue. I know that that the model um, uh, that that we're going to use um, projects, uh, you know, significant demand on herring by striped bass on a seasonal basis. And for that reason, uh, you know, that that interaction hadn't hasn't been been modeled specifically or at least not not peer reviewed if i remember correctly um and so i i went to john deroba and i asked him about the data that was available um to um, make this create this link between the two species the demand for menhaden excuse me for herring by striped bass this is what he said to me he said from 1985 to 2014 the average number of striped bass stomachs sampled in the spring and fall bottom trawl surveys was 41. The number of striped bass stomachs that actually contained an Atlantic herring averaged three. So the take home is that the bottom trawl surveys don't sample many striper stomachs at all, and very few actually contain herring. So I did not use that information at your AP meeting, but I did at the New Jersey AP meeting um, because I, I wanted to go right to the source, and uh, that's what John DeRoba, who is the uh, FMP, uh, excuse me, the herring um, uh, um, assessment biologist at, at the uh, Fishery Science Center, said to me about this relationship. So that's the only data that I have. All right. And just to add to that, you know, the, the Northeast Fishery Science Center food habits database was not the only source of data that we were using on um, food habits for striped bass or for the other species. So we do have some other sources of data um, from on that included striped bass um, and the herring relationship. But it's true that the ERP model um, is kind of sensitive to the levels of herring, which is why we're recommending that sort of status quo intermediate level of herring as part of the reference point calculations as opposed to um, the the threshold or below threshold levels of Atlantic herring when we're actually calculating the reference points. Uh, any follow up on that, John? Uh, no, no, not right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any, any other hands, Tony? I'm just giving it a pause just to make sure there's none. John McMurray, you just put your hand back up again. Okay, he took it down. All right, you just have uh, Justin Davis. Okay. All right, Justin, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, at this point, I'd like to make a motion, and I think staff has that motion. So if uh, we could get that up on the screen, that'd be great. Mr. Right, Chairman, do you want me to read it? Okay. Yeah. Um, if you would, please read it. Yeah. 
I moved to set the total allowable catch at 176,800 metric tons for 2021 and 187,400 metric tons for 2022, which are the levels associated with a 50% probability of exceeding the ERP fishing mortality target, respectively. Um, if I get a second, I'd be happy to speak to the motion. All right, thank you. We have a motion for consideration. Do I have a second? Jim Estes. We have a second from Jim Estes from Florida. All right, Justin, as a maker of the motion, I'm going to allow you to uh, make some comments. Great, right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, I think we're faced with a pretty significant and precedent setting decision today. But in my mind, I view it as a pretty straightforward decision. Uh, I was really proud to be a member of this commission when we took the vote at the last meeting to adopt the ERP framework for managing Menhaden. It's been a constant backdrop of my, you know, about 20 year career now in fisheries management, this discussion about the need for ecosystem based management and also a sort of the challenges and frustrations in implementing it. Uh, so I think it was, you know, a really big moment when this commission took the vote to implement ERPs at the last meeting and I think it's really telling that we heard sort of an outpouring of support um, and positive thoughts about that decision from a wide spectrum of the public across multiple stakeholder groups. So, you know, to me, there, there's a lot of challenges in implementing ecosystem management. One is developing kind of the scientific machinery or infrastructure to provide the scientific advice you need to do it. And, you know, we were fortunate that we had some really talented people working for a number of years to develop the science to allow this move. There's also kind of the administrative challenge of making the jump to ecosystem management in, in face of, you know, the uncertainty of what that means for your current management framework. And, you know, we had to sit discussions about that at previous meetings at the policy board about what does this mean for the commission to make this move? There's uncertainty how it'll play out in the future, but we took that brave step of doing it anyways. Uh, I think one of the kind of sneakier aspects of what's difficult about ecosystem management is that it really makes you make clear value judgments uh, about what you're going to value, what you want out of the ecosystem, and, and then using those value judgments to inform how you how you make decisions on trade-offs. So, you know, one of the problems with single species management is that we get stuck in this sort of fallacy of uh, thinking we can have our cake and eat it too by looking at species in a vacuum. We try to manage them for high abundance, manage everything for high abundance, manage all fisheries for high output. What ecosystem management makes us do is recognize we poss can't possibly do all those things at once that we're gonna have to make some trade-offs. So when we adopted this ERP framework, I think what this board was, was saying was that we were going to value and prioritize Menhaden as a forage fish, that we would make decisions about Menhaden management with that in mind, and that we would take a precautionary approach to manhandled management in the future, given its value to all the other species that we're managing, and that we'd look at trade-offs through that lens. So, you know, given that, and, and given that today we're making a pretty precedent-setting decision, because this is the first time we're really implementing this new approach, I think it's important that we take a, a risk-averse approach. And so, to me, you know, a 50% probability isn't really even risk averse necessarily. It's, it's this default probability we use quite a bit and it's because it's right in the middle. It's really neither risk averse nor risky. It's sort of splitting the difference. You know, we use this 50% probability all the time when we're making decisions. So for me, that's why I feel it's, a, it's appropriate here. Uh, you know, we, we are working on a more robust risk and uncertainty, you know, approach that uh, Connor McManus mentioned earlier, we saw a great presentation on that at a previous meeting. I'm hopeful we'll be able to use that in the near future. But for right now, without that, I think this 50% probability is really an appropriate approach. For sure, there's uncertainty here about this decision. We talked earlier today about some of the uncertainties in the model uh, with biomass, natural mortality, and recruitment. There's uncertainty about future states of other species that are part of this ERP framework uncertainty about fishery performance. Uh, there's also the fact that the Menhaden stock is in a very robust state. Uh, so all of these things, I, I could see how these would lend towards an idea of, well, maybe we can hedge here a little bit and sort of try not to take as much of a cut on the fishery side. Uh, to me, those, those arguments are not very persuasive. I don't think it's in line with what the majority of the public and our stakeholders want. They wanna see us take a precautionary approach to Menhaden management. 
you know, at a previous meeting we discussed, and this came up again today, the, the idea of the herring buffer, that there's sources of uncertainty here that indicate we should maybe be more precautionary than 50%. Um, and also, you know, looking at the Manhattan stock by itself and saying it's really robust, we're nowhere near the F threshold. To me, that's not persuasive because that's backsliding into that single species mindset of just looking at Manhattan in a vacuum. So. Uh, for all those reasons, I, I would really like to see this board make a decision today to adopt uh, these tax that represent the 50% probability. I think to me, this is sort of us making final delivery on the promise that was encapsulated in this ERP approach we have adopted. Uh, so I'm hopeful that the uh, board will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. I, I appreciate that. Uh, very well said. So. Uh, we have a motion, uh, so I want to open up uh, the floor for some discussion, further discussion on this motion. So, uh, Tony, uh, what have you got for hands? We have Allison Colton and Nick Lomaserve. Okay, go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the maker of the motion did a great job sort of laying this out. So, there's a, just a couple points that I'd like to emphasize here. Um, with respect to the adoption of ERPs, the you know this was a long time coming um, and something that the board had committed to, and we finally took that step in August. But this decision is really the first time, the first opportunity that we have to walk the walk of ERPs, and I think it's important to demonstrate to all of those who supported the adoption of ERPs that um, the board is committed to not only uh, adopting that framework, but making sure that it's implemented in a way that it achieves its intended goals. Um, you know, even talking about the broad, broad swath of individuals that supported the adoption of ERPs, even the industry supported the adopted adoption of ERPs and indicated their willingness to work with the board in the implementation of ERPs. So, um, you know, I hope that is the case moving forward, you know, no matter what our decision is here today, but, you know, industry did indicate their support for the adoption of ERPs. And, and I think that we have that support behind us um, when we're making these decisions. Um, one important point, I think Katie Drew has also made clear through our questions and discussion this morning is that we need to be achieving this Manhattan F target if we are going to be effectively implementing ERPs. Um, talked about the fact that striped bass is simply an indicator species for the full suite of um, you know, animals and organisms that are in the ecosystem model. Um, and that the striped bass board has already taken actions to try and deal with striped bass and bring striped bass to its F target. But if we are not doing our due diligence on our end as the Menhaden board to make sure that we're achieving uh, fishing mortality rate at the Menhaden ERP target, then we're not going to achieve rebuilding of striped bass, um, which gets back to John Clark's point earlier about economic impacts. Um, there's economic impacts on both ends. Uh, if we don't achieve rebuilding of striped bass, there could be huge economic impacts uh, throughout the entirety of the coast, um, considering what an important fishery it is uh, among a lot of states. So um, I just wanted to lend my support for this motion, reiterate Justin's point too, that um, really a 50% probability comes down to a coin flip and um, maybe we should be shooting for more than that, but I think that this should be uh, our primary consideration as we move through this discussion that we really need to focus on implementing a TAC that will achieve the ERP goals and objectives that we uh, adopted at the last meeting. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Allison. Okay, uh, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me okay now? I had to change my audio connection. Yeah, I've got you loud and clear. Okay, great. I guess the kindergarten Zoom is taking up a little bit too much bandwidth. Um, but I wanted to, um, you know, support a large amount of what Dr. Davis and Colden just said. Um, I do agree that 50% probability is the appropriate probability to be setting the tack to manage this fishery using the ERPs that were unanimously supported by the board. 
and it's important that we act in a way that upholds that decision and meets the expectations that we would actually implement the ERPs in a, in a credible manner. But I do think the board could use a bit of discretion into how we achieve that that could um, balance the ecosystem objectives with the fishery objectives um, just in a, in, a, in a minor you know, it, way that, that phases in attaining that 50% probability over two years. Um, so unfortunately, the, the projections that we have present, you know, two options to achieve that 50% probability. Um, one, which would, which is part of the motion, um, which would cause, I believe, undue um, instability in the fishery by causing an 18% reduction only to be followed by a 6% increase. Um, the other option, if we set it constant at the lower level for two years, would forgo that, that increase um, in quota in 2022. So what I, I wish we had asked the, the TC, no fault of their own, um, hindsight is 2020, um, that we didn't ask for this, um, would be a, a TAC that achieves the 50% probability in, by the second year and in that way phases it in. Um, that type of approach would still achieve our end goal in just two years, but provide more stability, as I said, for the mini and fishery and the, and the secondary users. Um, but lacking that particular analysis, there is one projection in the TC's memo that um, for the 10% quoted decrease to 194,400 metric tons, which results in a 52.5% probability of exceeding the ERP target in 2022. When you consider that the projections um, for 2020 um, include the, the tax for 2020, 2021, and 22, and then being taken in full, which, as we've discussed, is inconsistent with the recent fishery performance um, due to some inherent inefficiencies in a state-by-state -state quota allocation system. It, it's very possible that the actual probability would be at 50% for 2022. So I would, um, if you'd entertain it now, Mr. Chairman, like to make a motion to substitute um, this. Tell you what, it just just hold that for a minute and let me make sure that we don't have any more discussions on this primary motion. Um, Tony, are there any hands raised waiting to be called on? Um, uh, Robert LaFrance just put his hand up just now, so I don't know if that's in response to what Nicola is talking about or your question. All right. Uh, Rob, go go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I guess, I wanted to make certain that I was on the record as supporting uh, Dr. Davis's motion for the for the many reasons that he talked about. I just wanted to sort of reiterate the point of view that this is the first time um, ERP evaluation that that the board is wor working on. And I think it's really important that we do it the way that is sort of the way it should be set out, looking to that fifty percent probability as opposed to something less than that. So I guess I just wanted to strongly support Dr. Davis's uh, motion and make certain that people understand that this has kind of been really significant for a lot of reasons in terms of the board's action. And to be at the 50% based upon what we've seen thus far, I just think it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's, as Dr. Davis mentioned, scientifically defensible, as well as something that I think many of the, many of the folks who are watching this uh, deliberation this morning I uh, would like to see us do. So thank you for the time, sir. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Um, any other hands up? Um, um, I don't believe so. Allison, your hand is still up. If you wanted it to be up, All right, she took it down, so she didn't really mean for it to be up. So there's no other hands that are currently up. All right, so Nicola, um, back to you, and I'll certainly entertain uh, a motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, on the basis of producing landings that result, would result in no more than a 50% prob probability of exceeding the ERP F target by 2020, I would like to move to substitute to set a um, total allowable catch of 194,400 metric tons for 2021 and 2022. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Megan Ware. Right, we have a motion by Nicola Meserve and a second by Megan Ware. All right. Okay, so I'll open up the floor for uh, 
comments, questions, and discussion on the two motion. You have um, Megan Ware, Maureen Davidson, John McMurray, Steve Bowman, and Nicola, your hand is still up. Didn't know if you wanted to speak to your motion or not. Your hand is down, so, and not Nicola. Okay, uh, so uh, Megan, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so kind of reading through the public comments we've received, I think there are two things that the public is watching for in the board's decision today. And the first is kind of our signal on our level of risk with the F target. And then the second is a commitment to implementing ERPs. And that Nicholas motion, which I seconded, addresses both of the points. Um, I think this option is trying to balance here and it takes measurable steps towards getting towards that 50% risk target in two years. I also believe that as we are taking those significant and positive steps to the 50% target, this option is affirming that the board is committed to implementing ERPs. Um, I don't believe that this is setting a precedent for the board moving away from that 50% target, but rather this is a critical step in our implementation of ERPs, which are new to all of us. There are a couple of things which some people have mentioned that make me comfortable with uh, the motion to substitute. The first is that the projections do assume that full 2020 TAC is harvested. To date, we have not harvested a full Menhaden TAC, so I think there is a bit of a buffer with that assumption. And then I'll also note, um, as others have mentioned, that I really wish, wish we had our risk and uncertainty policy to kind of guide us in this decision. But I do believe that stock status is something that can inform Kind of the window of risk that the board feels is acceptable. And given the strong status of the Manhattan stock, I am comfortable taking the two years to get towards that 50% target, knowing that this option is resulting in a significant reduction in the TAC and landings, um, which will further promote a healthy Manhattan stock. So I'm going to support the motion to substitute. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. All right, uh, Maureen Davison. Thank you. Uh, both Nicola and Megan uh, gave reason, I agree with their reasons for moving to substitute uh, the motion. I say that we definitely should continue to move uh, to in, towards uh, achieving our ERPs and our ERP targets. Uh, but I think if we do it gradually, uh, sort of in a stepwise motion, we'll be able to bring all of our stakeholders along with us as we move forward. I don't, I, I'm uncomfortable with us taking a very large step in the beginning, which can adversely affect uh, many of the users of the Manhattan resource. We can still move forward. We can eventually get to our 50% probability, uh, but let's do it in a more gradual stepwise motion so that we do not strongly affect um, some of our users. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. All right, uh, John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Nicola, can you clarify the probabilities of exceeding F in the first and second year with this TAC? And then I have a, a follow-up comment. May I, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Nicola. Okay, um, so looking at table three in the um, memo from the TC, the this is, this is the analysis that represented the 10% quota reduction, and it results in a 58.5% probability of exceeding the ERP target in 2021 and a 52.5% in 2022 based on the landings in 2020, 2021, and 2022 achieving the full TAC. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I missed that. In the in the material. Um, so I, I want to be okay with this because I don't think it's unreasonable, uh, but I'm having a difficult time doing that because the way the general public will see this is that we agreed unanimously to adopt an ERP in August, ERPs in August with the support of scientists, academics, anglers, conservationists, pretty much everyone. But while the board said it would manage Menahaden for their role in the ecosystem, well, 
when it comes down to actually having to make a decision to constrain landings, one well, that will have at least a 50% chance of achieving that intent, well, then no, we're not going to do that. We're going to going to take a gradual approach and we'll continue managing Menhaden as if it were just another industrial commodity. Um, it's the same old perception that the public has had about this management body since for as long as I can remember. We don't make difficult decisions that might impact industry, even when the science is clear that we should. We capitulate to special interest, and uh, frankly, it's hard to argue that that perception is incorrect. A 50% probability of success should be the bare minimum, given all the uncertainties here, um, particularly given the recent status of striped bass, bluefish, weakfish, herring, and, and not in spite of their, their status. And the model only includes a handful of species that depend on menhaden. It doesn't account for things like whales, which are probably the biggest consumer of menhaden in the ocean. And really, we should probably be considering a buffer. I think anything over 50% would be inconsistent with the ERP objectives, and the public will certainly look at it as such. Um, I think we need to do the right thing here, not just for Menhaden, striped bass, whales, but also for the integrity of the commission. So I don't support the motion. Thank you, John. All right, Steve Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In all due respect to my colleague, Mr. McMurray, um, I, I'm not going to strongly disagree, but I am going to disagree on a certain number of, uh, of issues. When uh, when the uh, tables came out and I started looking at them, uh, Virginia has, over the past several years, demonstrated a very, very conservative approach to the manage of Menhaden. We don't have to re rehash what the Commonwealth of Virginia has done, what we've asked for, and different things that, that, that we've done that have been supported by this commission, and we are greatly appreciative for that. However, um, after taking the time to talk with my colleagues on the commission and also with the stakeholders that I also uh, am responsible for representing, um, I believe that this motion uh, is a good one. One of my colleagues made the comment that you know, and, and I think Ms. Davidson kind of alluded to it, that the ERPs should have an opportunity to work. We should have a chance to take a look and see how, they're, how, how things are going. But at the same time, they should not be punitive in nature. And one can argue whether they're punitive and whether that equates to kicking the can down the road. I don't believe so. I believe that the 10% uh, the number um, is, is an appropriate number to give us an opportunity for the two year period of time, uh, which um, in response to a, a, the question that Mr. Murray, McMurray made, we're at 52.5% in the second year, which approaches very closely to the 50%. So, I mean, while we're looking at numbers and looking at different variations, we also have to consider the people that are involved in this as well. And uh, whether you call them special interest I call them uh, just as much a part of the matrix, the bait industry, the reduction industry. Um, we need to consider that in the grand scheme of the decision-making process. And that's the reason I'm going to support the motion. I believe this is a good motion. Uh, I did find it uh, interesting that uh, from the AP report, uh, and, and I'll finish with this, that the AP report, the AP meeting was not unlike the Fishery Management Advisory Committee meetings that we have uh, in, in Virginia. There are those that are on one end of the spectrum. There are those on the other end of the spectrum, and nobody seems to be in the middle. And sometimes the middle road is the place to go. And for that, Mr. Chairman, that's the reason I support the motion. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. Um, Tony, any other hands? We have um, Connor McManus. Lynn Fagley, Joseph Nino, Allison Colden, and Roy Miller. All right, go ahead, Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I won't be able to support this motion for a couple of reasons. Um, one being uh, with the suite of reasons that Justin or Dr. Davis has described in his original motion. Um, I think as we moved into the ERP framework, we are looking to try and um, inform our management practices practices with the um, best science available. And I think somewhat ignoring the um, 
Table two, I'm looking at actual percentages of probability of exceeding the ERP target and relying on um, changes in TAC, five, 10 percent in and of itself um, does not behoove us towards that effort. Um, also, uh, in the context of the risk and uncertainty policy framework, um, I think ultimately we're, we've been discussing 50 percent, but ideally come 2022, that percentage or probability of exceeding the ERP target will be identified or defined by that policy framework, which we would then move to that. So um, I think it, in the absence of that now, the 50% um, allows us to continue towards this effort of making um, science-informed management decisions, but ideally in a future year, um, we wouldn't necessarily be kind of burning into a 50% probability. We'd be guided by um, this new tool. Thanks. Thank you, Connor. All right, uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I, I just wanted to um, speak in support of this motion. Um, I, I think this is a very measured and deliberative way for this board to move into the realm of ERPs. Um, this is a groundbreaking piece of management. It's new, we haven't done it before, and I think it is our responsibility um, to make sure that we're not um, punitive as we move forward, that we walk the path rather than jump off the cliff. You know, and I'll just say from a point of history, it was in um, it was in the fall of 2011 um, when this board adopted the first reference point for Menhaden um, at F 30 percent target. And, you, you know, I, I just will say that adopting a target of F 30 percent for this fishery, that is not a, a particularly conservative level, but it. That was a step from what was essentially an unmanaged um, fishery. We actually set those reference points and the controversy that surrounded that was enormous. And I just wanna take a moment to say that in nine years, since 2011, we have moved from a fishery that was um, running with some you know, spatial and temporal restrictions um, to this. And I, I don't think anybody, anybody, not our stakeholders on all sides, um, you should undersell um, the value of what we've done and the direction that we are moving. I'm so proud of our science and our scientists. And, and I really do think that when we're talking about the difference between a 50% probability and a 52 um, and a half percent probability in year two of exceeding the target and a zero percent chance of exceeding the threshold. Um, I think that um, puts us on, on very solid ground to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I, I appreciate those, those comments. Sometimes it's easy to get uh, caught up in the now and forget the, the, where we've been and, and uh, what we have continued to strive to accomplish. So, at uh, Joe Semino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to speak in favor of the substitute. Um, you know, Justin Davis started this off, and uh, I found myself, as usual, agreeing with him that that you know this is a highly complex modeling and and you know something new for us to some extent and. And then, you know, he kind of mentioned that the 50% probability is is old hat, something we've done plenty of times. But the 50% probability here plays into this, this modeling and all the assumptions that, that are taking place, including recruitment and assumptions that landings are going to be, um, you know, at, our, at the TAC or, or similar to past landings. Um, so... So we're looking at something different, and it's very clear that you know folks around the table have, and in, and in the general public, have a hard time understanding what 50% probability means. We hear this coin flip example thrown out there. Um, the TC did a great job with the density plots, trying to show that it's you know it's it's a lot more complex than that, 
and we're talking about a certain number of model runs that fall within um, within a certain bounds, right? <clears throat> in my opinion, and Katie Drew hinted at the fact that the, the uncertainty in the next two years on all of those playing in um, kind of changes where we're going. We know long-term we need to be conservative. Luckily, we're able to set a tack every year. We know we can readjust in the future if we need to. Um, you know, to me, I look at some of the other things in this model. Um, we heard in both February and August that the reliance on Atlantic herring um, seems a bit unrealistic. Sensitivity runs that they did um, that kind of only look at that spatially and temporally are more realistic, uh, more in line, as as uh, Dr. Sierra said, with the with the diet data. But they don't have that peer review yet to kind of add that to this equation. In, in that case, to me, that gives us that buffer for Atlantic herring. Um, I think that as we see the, the 2020 landings, as we get a better understanding for where we are, um, and hopefully get a risk policy that helps guide us here in making decisions in 2022, um, we will see that, that you know, this substitute motion was uh, getting us exactly where we needed to be. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Allison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to make one specific comment. Those in, at, or who are supporting the substitute motion have, have provided a lot of information in support of their positions, but there's one very specific thing that I'd like to respond to because I think it could set a precedent, which um, at least for me personally makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And that is, um, you know, in this making this decision, uh, making the assumption that the 2020 landings will continue to underperform the TAC. Um, you know, based on the information that we're seeing, what we've heard from the AP about the, the struggles related to the coronavirus pandemic, that may very well be the case. Um, but I just find it difficult and I'm in an uncomfortable situation for the board to uh, allow that assumption to weigh in our calculus when we are looking at different risk probabilities associated with the decision we're making now. So um, I just wanted to go on the record making the point that we do not currently have any preliminary or final information on the 2020 landings. Um, and so the, the risks associated with however um, far that may be uh, under-realized in 2020, um, personally, I don't think should weigh into the calculus here. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to weigh in in support of the substitute motion and for um, a number of reasons, two of which I'll highlight. One, there were no economic considerations factored into the decision making uh, for the original motion nor the substitute motion directly. Um, so I, I favor the substitute motion because it, it, it does a, a, at least give some consideration to the economic consequences of reducing the quota. Um, and for that, I find the substitute motion favorable. And it, the actual value of 194,400 metric tons for 2021 and 2022 is within the range of what the industry has uh, achieved over the past three years. So I'm, uh, I appreciate the eloquent arguments that were offered by uh, the makers of the motion and some of the responders of the original motion and also I appreciate the comments of um, Lynn Fegley for the substitute, and therefore, I think the substitute is a reasonable way to go at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Mike, Tony, uh, anybody else in the queue? Yes, we have um, Thad Altman, Justin Davis, Connor, I don't think you put your hand down, um, and then Eric Reed, and I was correct on Connor. Okay. Uh, Pat, go ahead. Uh, 
Matt, can you hear me? I, yes, yes. I just want to say uh, a few things. One, I'm against the substitute motion. Um, it undoes the original motion that is a concept and an action that is extremely well thought out based on good science. So it was an extremely well-crafted motion and it's a measured approach. I think it, uh, that's the direction we need to take and therefore I'm against the substitute motion. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate that. Uh, Dustin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, if it's appropriate, I'd like to move to amend the substitute motion. Uh, okay, go ahead. So I'd like to amend the substitute motion to read, move to substitute to set a tack of 194,400 metric tons for 2021 and 187,400 metric tons for 2022. All right, do we have a motion to amend the substitute for consideration is, uh, let me finish, finish getting this up there and we'll ask for a second. Can you just repeat those values, please? Sure, so essentially the value for 2021 would stay the same at 194,400 metric tons but the value for 2022 would be 187,400 metric tons. Okay, so we have a motion to amend the substitute. Uh, do we have a second? Eric Reed, are you seconding that or are you just wanting to speak? I'm not seconding it. I would like to speak. Okay, just wanted to confirm. You have two right. methods. We have a second. Uh, Jim Estes. Jim Estes second. Okay. All right. So we have a a, a motion to amend the substitute before the board now. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and go to you, Eric, and then uh, for those who wish to speak to. Motion to amend, uh, raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue. So go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, actually, as far as the amendment for the substitute, I'm not really sure what the difference is because my guess is we're going to be revisiting before 2022 anyway. So, but my point it goes to Mr. Miller's point as well. What does concern me is the science that's lacking in this is the economic science, the socioeconomic science, which is a science. Uh, Mr. Kalin referenced an ex vessel price of 10 cents in his report. And at 94,400 tons, uh, that's $4.7 million in ex vessel revenue. And if you use an average or a modest economic multiplier, it's usually 3.1 which puts puts the value of that fishery, the loss, at $14,758,000 in one year. And you take it over two years and it's pretty close to $30 million. And that does concern me. And I, I supported ERPs when we voted on them. Absolutely, I support them. But I think that the substitute, not amended, the substitute, is a step in the right direction. Uh, it's not a giant step. And I agree with that, but it is a step towards fully utilizing ERPs. And if we take it a little bit at a time, at least we'll have the direction will be the right direction, but we can at least analyze the effects of it over a little bit longer time. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. All right. Uh, so I'd like to invite those who want to speak to the motion to amend the substitute to weigh in now. Justin Davis and Joe Semino. Okay, go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll, I'll try to provide a little bit of rationale here for this amendment. Uh, I'm, I'm receptive to the arguments that are being made ar around the table about concerns about the original motion. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading those concerns to be concerns about the large reduction in the TAC uh, 
that the original motion proposes to move to next year, uh, and also a sort of desire to make, more, make a more gradual move towards getting to this 50% probability, essentially not trying to get there in one step next year, but trying to get there over two years. My concern about the substitute motion is that probability of exceeding F target in the first year, 58.5%. I just feel that's too high. It's not in keeping with what I think the vast majority of the public wants to see us do here. So what I'm kind of proposing here is I'm, I'm trying to sort of split the difference with the idea that if we have a tack of 194,400 metric tons for 2021, that represents a much less substantial drop in the tack next year. And I think if you look at the table of tack versus landings, this tack of 194,400 metric tons represents, you know, if, if the entire tack is caught, not a substantial deviation from what landings have been in recent years. And then by setting it at 187,400 tons in 2022, we will essentially end up at the same point where we would have ended up with the original motion of getting to a level in 2022 that's associated with the 50% probability. I, I understand that it's a little bit apples and oranges here and um, that, you know, that 187,400 metric tons was predicted to get us to the 50% probability under that scenario of setting uh, different tax in 2021 and 2022. But I think ultimately what this does is sends the signal to the public that we're committed to getting to that 50% probability, which is appropriately uh, appropriately precautionary tack. We'll do it in two years. We'll try to have less of a jump down for the fishery next year. So that's my rationale for making this amendment. Thank you, Justin. All right, uh, Joe Samino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'm actually going to direct this maybe to to Tony as a procedural question instead of trying to put um, either the, any of the staff on who have developed these tables on, on the spot here. But uh, Tony, you had mentioned if we're setting 2022, and um, you know this is kind of an on-the-fly motion. If if we were to Prove this amended substitute would then it take a two thirds majority if we found that the math really didn't work to come back and revisit this later. That's my question. Thank you. Correct. If you approve this motion, then you would need to do two thirds majority to change it later on. Thank you, Tony. Uh, any other hands to speak to the motion to amend? Justin, you know your hand is up. Is that on purpose or? Okay, nope, it wasn't. So I don't see any other hands, uh, but the public had, there was a member of the public in the comments that said they wanted to comment at some point on the tax motions. All right, well, we have, we have three motions here that we've got to dispense with. Um, Thanks for the, in the interest of just letting us ponder on this a little bit, I will uh, open it up for some limited public comment. So uh, if you're a member of the public, you wish to comment, um, raise your hand and, and please try to keep your comments focused on the, the tax related motions and uh, limit them to three minutes. What do we have, Tony? All right. I know Peter Hemchuk had had, um, has asked right. for, he is first. All right, Pete, go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, this um, this entire exercise is about risk and uncertainty. And uh, my AP comments were along the line of what the federal councils are dealing with, with OFLs and not targets. Um, the Manhattan resource has been managed so precautionarily since 2013 that when an ERP model came up with reference points, we were already under it. The NWAX MICE model is supposed to be used for illustrative purposes. And to that end, I mean, be careful about risks that may be unintended. Uh, the probability of restoring striped bass is 41% of reaching the target biomass in 2029. Leaving so many menhaden in the water 
uh, bluefish are closer to their um, SSB threshold. And striped bass needs a couple good recruitment years. We all recognize that, but also recognize that the NWAX mice model could also show, would also, has also shown that bluefish moving ahead and being restored could be to the detriment of striped bass by predation of bluefish on striped bass recruits. So uh, again, trade-offs are necessary in all this risk and uncertainty. Uh, we still, omega protein still supports the status quo tack for the next two years. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else, Tony? Jeff Kalen. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I pretend that I'm at the table now at the other end of the room, um, not sitting as the chair. I just simply wanted to say that I really appreciate Ms. Meserves and, and Ms. Ware's motion and the support for that motion that I've heard from several people uh, around the table who I have a lot of respect for. Not that I don't have a lot of respect for those who, who support the underlying motion. I don't, I don't mean to say that, but uh, we've all been at this for a long time and uh, I really appreciate the spirit of the, of this, not the amended substitute, but the substitute motion. And I, I would hope that the board could find a way to get to that today. And, um, you know, we, we do, you know, also think the 216 is not going to cause any is issues uh, in a negative sense, but I think the optics of this uh, is important uh, too. So for that reason, I just wanted to support, speak in strong support of the, the motion to substitute by uh, Nicola and, and Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody else, Tony? I don't see any other members of the public with their hands raised. Uh, very good. All right. we, we've had some robust discussion, and we've got to work our way back up to our main motion. So uh, uh, how about we take uh, five minutes to caucus? And when we return from caucusing, we will uh, call the vote on the motion to amend and dispense with it uh, and then work our way back up. So uh, I've got 1104, so we'll be back uh, for a vote at 1109. Maya, will you just write underneath at the very bottom caucusing until 1109? Thanks, Maya. And Spud, I'm just letting you know that your mic is open in case you are wanting to make a call for caucusing. Thank you. There's nobody here but me, so I can't caucus. I didn't know if we were going to be talking to anyone or anything on the phone. Yeah, I understand. Thank you.
Okay, I have 1109. Um, if anybody feels they need a little, little more time for caucusing, if you'll, you'll raise your hand uh, right now. Um, Emerson Hasbrook put his hand up, as did Chris Scott Savage, and Justin Davis has his hand up. Um, is that uh, a little more time? Is that what you're asking for? Mr. Chairman, this is Justin Davis. I actually just wanted to ask Tony if we're going to follow the procedure we've kind of been following at these meetings with reading off the states that vote different ways because, you know, we're not around the table and can't see each other. So it's sometimes helpful to see uh, which st states voted which way. Yep. I will read um, the state as they vote in favor or against and it's also a good check to make sure that your hand has been raised if you don't hear me call your state or jurisdiction then it seems i didn't have a hand for you I uh, emerson uh chris questions uh no i'm good and we're done coxon thank you mr chair okay emerson how about you yeah we still need a couple of more minutes here thank you okay um all right, let's just uh, tell you what, in the interest of giving everybody plenty of time, uh, let's take another five minutes. So 11.15.
Okay, if I can call us back to order after our caucusing. Um, Tony, if you'll go over that uh, voting procedure one more time, uh, just to make sure everybody's clear on it. We'll do, um, you'll ask for those in favor. Um, one member from each state will raise their hand. Um, we typically ask the administrative commissioners unless this data is worked out somebody else. I will read the name of each state that has their hand up and then staff will I um, will put all the hands down once we have all those states and then you'll ask for those against same thing will happen null votes or abstentions. And Very then good okay. I'm going to assume that everybody's uh, completed their caucusing and is ready to vote. And so, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tony, to call for the vote. Um, looking for those in favor to please raise your hand. And I'm just going to give it a second to let those hands get up. I have Connecticut, South Carolina, Pennsylvania. North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Put those hands down. Those, Jim Estes, you just put your hand up. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, those against. I have New York. New Jersey, Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, Delaware, Maine, Rhode Island, Virginia, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maryland, and PRFC. I'm going to put the hands down. Uh, uh, those nulls, N-U-L-L, -L, null, null votes. I do not see any hands raised for nulls, abstentions. I do not see any hands raised for abstentions. Max, can you give us the count, please? Yep, let me tally it up one second. <clears throat> I have five in favor, 13 opposed. I thought we had uh, six in favor. It was Connecticut, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Is that right? Am I wrong? I, I did not have Florida in favor, so if Florida could correct that. Yes, we were in favor. This is Jim. That would be six in favor, 12 opposed. Okay, motion to amend fails. So now we are back to the move to substitute. Um, there's been fairly robust discussion on this uh, motion. Anybody uh, feel a strong urge to add anything else to the discussion on this motion? If so, raise your hand. Any no hands, hands, Tony? No hands. Okay. Uh, then we will call the question on this motion. So, Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Steve Bowman just raised his hand. Oh, nope. He took it down. So, is there a need for caucus, bud? Um, I don't think so. I think we've, we've had ample time to talk us, uh, unless somebody feels otherwise. If so, raise your hand very quickly. If not, we'll move on. All right. I don't see any hands raised for that. Okay. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. All 
I have New York, New Jersey, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, Delaware, South Carolina, Maine, Virginia, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maryland, and PRFC. I will put the hands down for the group. All those against the motion. I have Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. I will put the hands down. Are there any null votes, N-U-L-L? -L? I see no hands. Are there any abstentions? I see no hands. Max, just to confirm, I have 12 in favor and six against. Let me know if you get that same count. Yes, that's the same count I have. 12 in favor, six opposed. No nulls and no abstentions. Okay, motion to substitute carries and now becomes the main motion. All right. Um, and Spud, if you'll just give Maya a moment to um, make a new main motion so folks know what they're voting on. And Maya, I think you can do a new slide if you wanted to. It's getting a little we'll Okay. But I think maybe for the record, if you could read this motion as the main motion. I will. Thank you. Do we need to add that other, uh, any language in there about associated probabilities or just it's kind of the way it is? I think it's, it's the way it was made, so. Um, I think it's in the record and just Maya, um, there's no maker or seconder. It's a property of the, um, the board at this point. Um, I believe if you're, if you are satisfied that it's in the record, but and the board is satisfied, then, um, I don't think you need to add it. Okay. I'm, I'm fine. I think we'll have plenty of documentation in the transcript as to what the intent was here. So, so, uh, we have a motion before the board move to set a total allowable catch of 194,400 metric tons for 2021 and 2022. Do we need to add in uh, act for Atlantic Menhaden or is it good, good the way it is? I think it's fine. We know that this is the Menhaden board. You guys can't set any other, any other species right. tax. So. <laughs> um, um, any, um, any need to caucus on this? I wouldn't think so. I think we've, we've pretty much covered it. Uh, if so, Raise your hand quickly if you feel the need. You need caucus. Um, I see no hands. hand. No, no okay. Sir. All right. Well, let's uh, call the vote. Uh, John Clark just put his hand up. Hi. Right, uh, go ahead, John. No, I'm sorry. I I, I thought you had called the vote. I'm sorry. I'm just voting yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, John. All right, I will call that vote. Um, and just to note for Maya, um, if you could put in here that this is final action, so it is a roll call vote, um, but because I say the name of every state, it ends up being a roll call anyway. Uh, so um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. I have New York, New Jersey, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, South Carolina, Maine, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maryland, and PRFC. If I didn't call your state, 
please let me know if you had your hands raised. Right. I'm going to put the hands down. Sorry to interject. Tony, I thought I heard Delaware was voting yes, but I didn't hear there that state called off. I believe you're correct, but John, did I not call your state? I apologize. That's all right. We're yes. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. And Eric, your mic is open, just so you know. Um, those against the motion. I have Connecticut, Rhode Island, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. I'm going to put the hands down. Any null votes? There are no null votes. Any abstentions? No abstentions. Max, did you have 13? Five zero zero. That's correct. Thirteen in favor, five opposed. And Maya, if you could please write roll call next to that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And uh, thanks everyone. We have uh, made that decision. I appreciate the the uh, lively discussion. Uh, I think there are a lot of good points made. Uh, we have obviously entered a uh, a new era in, in fisheries management and uh, i've kind of equated this to it's one thing to stand at the altar and say i do as a whole another thing to make the marriage work so uh hopefully we're going to make this marriage work uh, and in any good marriage there has to be some compromise so i think we're, uh, we're moving in that direction so um with that uh we've come to other business and i will uh, call on megan Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This should be really quick, but um, I did want to note that Amendment 3 has a provision which requires the board to revisit allocation every three years and uh, time flies and 2020 is the third year under Amendment 3. So I think we've met this trigger. Um, I'm not hoping to have this conversation today, but I'm wondering if this is something that could be added to the winter meeting agenda just so we can start that conversation. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, uh, we, we've been talking about uh, next year, uh, looking ahead uh, with the mandate to do an allocation review. Uh, we will not have complete information for 2020 until April. Uh, we can certainly convene a meeting uh, in February uh, to talk about how we want to approach the allocation review, what, what data sources uh, we would ask to be reviewed and collated as well as what other issues of concern about Menhaden management that we need to be discussing. Uh, doesn't need necessarily need to be a very long meeting, uh, but just a heads up that we can have the discussion, but we probably really won't have uh, any detailed quantitative information on which to do a lot of uh, discussion until the spring, but that, that's fine. So um, so it's it's on our plans and uh, you know, I'll work with with Tony and uh, and Bob and all to get uh, get us a meeting on the on the winter schedule. So, uh, Tony, anything you want to add to that? I'll just state if there is any information that the board does want us to bring forward at that February meeting to aid in that discussion, to please shoot myself or Kirby an email, and um, we'll start working on that. All right. Thank you. Uh, any anything else? Any other business that has uh, arisen during the course of today's meeting that we need to discuss? Any hands up, Tony? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, nope, no other hands are up. Okay. Well, again, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, um, these virtual meetings are a challenge. I guess we're getting sort of used to them now. Uh, hopefully, not too used to them. We would all rather be doing this face to face and uh, in our old traditional way, and hopefully that will happen sometime in the not too distant future. But uh, 
Uh, before I uh, call for a motion to adjourn, I just want to make sure everybody knows that this uh, this will be Max's uh, last uh, meeting with us. Uh, Max is moving uh, to NOAA Fisheries, effective, uh, I guess, November 1st. Uh, Max has done a great job. He's filled in for, for Kirby at this meeting while Kirby was off enjoying fatherhood and the lack of sleep that typically comes along with that. But Max has done a great job and uh, we, uh, I personally appreciate everything he's done to kind of help me. Uh, you know, all of us who cheer boards know that it's the staff that uh, makes us some breakfast and, and Max and, and Kirby and, and Tony all have done a great job. And uh, I want to just express my personal thanks and I know we're all giving him a, a virtual uh, round of applause and, and wish him the best. And I have a feeling that we will probably be seeing him again in, in his new role. So, uh, Max, would you like to say anything? I'm not good with these these thank, thankful speeches, but I, I really appreciate that, uh, Spud, and I look forward to working with everyone uh, in the future. All right, thank you. All right, with no other business to come before the management board, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'm gonna raise your hand. Motion to adjourn by Mel Bell. All right, very good, okay. With that, we will conclude our business and I guess we'll reconvene this afternoon for uh, South Atlantic Board. So thanks everybody.